Hello my friends, I'm Kayla. Today I'm going to tell you 19 of the books that I read in August. Here are my monthly stats. If you want to pause and peruse, if they mean anything to you, if you care about anything, there they are. And then here are all the books that I read. So I'm going to start just by genre. I was really looking for some mystery and thriller things this month to give five stars. Did I find them? No. <laughs> but let's talk about that chunk because there are some four stars in here for sure. Look Closer by David Ellis is a really interesting one because at this point I've forgotten pretty much all of the plot points of this because there was just so much going on but I did give this a four and I really enjoyed it and I would recommend it broadly. It's a really messy thriller. You've got Simon and Vicky, a married couple who seem on the outside, super stable, super secure in their relationship, in their careers, just in life. And then suddenly a woman dies in a suburb nearby and all of their secrets begin to unravel. There's a certain amount of money involved in this because one of them is wealthy and there's a trust fund that they will get access to after they've been married for a certain amount of time. And once you bring money into it and these little like weird side dealings and relationships they have going on, the con of it all comes to light. Even if you think you know what's going on in here, I'm sure you will be surprised by something. It was a really fascinating read. What I'm looking for in a thriller is to be entertained and surprised. I was surprised. I was not entertained, um, but I was interested the entire time. I wasn't finding it too long. I wasn't like objectively it's a little bit too long. Did we need this many pages to tell this story? No, but I was never bored. Definitely this is the kind of book you go into not really knowing anything, but if you want to delve into another kind of um, destructive marriage situation, it is that, but then it turns things on its head as well. Next up I've got History of Fear by Luke Dumas. And this is a story of this guy named Grayson. And at the beginning of the book, you find out that he has died in prison. He's been convicted of murdering a friend of his. And he said that the devil made him do it. And he is committed to that throughout the entire book. And so you're reading documents that this investigator has pulled, interviews that they have done, trying to figure out what was actually going on with this guy and if the devil is real, um, interviewing different people who knew Grayson, just a lot of investigation. And then you're reading his kind of memoir that he left behind in his prison cell. And that's exposing all of this history of his life growing up, the religious influence, how it damaged him, how his family life was not good, and then all of the relationships that he had. And through reading his perspective of things, and then all of the documents and interviews from other people and their perspective, you get two very different ideas of who this guy was. I don't remember what genre this is in, like a suspense, mystery, supernatural thing, because he does tell you about meeting the devil and all of his conversations with the devil and the fear he has of the devil. And from his perspective, he absolutely believes that the devil is the reason that he did this. And you know for a fact throughout the entire book that he did kill this person. And so it's more just building your own perspective throughout the read of what really happened. I also gave this one a four. The ending really solidified it for me and I wanna pick up more from this author. Next up, we've got another messy relationship dynamic with a twisted love story by Samantha Downing. This is a pretty vague synopsis. Um, but it also can't really give you much more because not much happens in here. Um, but you do have Wes and Ivy and they have a very tumultuous relationship. They're on and off, have been for years. And in one of those times where they were together, a uh, kind of horrific thing happened. And now in the current day storyline, we're following them getting back together for the nth time. And also a detective who is looking into that thing and learning about that thing that happened years ago and is going to expose them. And so they need to really come together this time and create a united front. Um, this was a two. If you wanna see my full rant, maybe, there's a live show that I'm just about to go to to discuss this fully. But like, it was more of a drama, which is fine if you like a drama and I would recommend it to people who love general fiction and then maybe they would be surprised by the extra elements that got thrown into it that make it a little bit thrilling. But I don't know, I just don't think I've ever read a book quite like this where it throws in so many characters and yet doesn't 
make them unique in any way or let you get to know them or add like a fun quirk to the book following all these perspectives. It was just like all of these names thrown in, all these random people that each of them worked with or their friends or the detective and all the people in her family and at her job and all of them just like looking at Ivy and Wes from afar and constantly being like, oh, they're not good for each other. They shouldn't be together. <laughs> hmm, I wonder if I can sleep with one of them. I wonder if any of them has something in their dark past I can reveal. Like the people who said, that this was slick and chilling and witty and twisty and compelling and deliciously clever. Like all of these people, I don't think I can trust their blurbs because that's just, it's not what this was. I have loved Samantha Downing in the past. I will continue to read more from her. Um, I just don't know what this was. It didn't pull any of the punches that I thought were coming. It didn't have any of these great reveals and all of these connections. Like it didn't do much of anything. If I forced you to read it for the book club and you did love it, I am so happy for you. And I want to, I want to be you. Then we've got a couple mystery books. I give three stars. So we've got The Villa by Rachel Hawkins. This is set in two different timelines. One is current day where we're following these two women who are both authors, but in varying success. And they decide to go together to this villa in Italy. And they're going to treat it as kind of a writing resort, kind of get back to their friendship and also feel inspired by a new location. And while they're there, I think they start to question their friendship even more. Like, do they have enough in common to remain friends? Has one of them done something in the past that has wronged the other and they need to kind of get over that? And then one of them finds in the library of the villa this book journal situation um, from 1974 following these musicians who stayed there and the drama that was going on amongst the group. And so you're reading equally both storylines but I feel like as the book goes on it gets more about the past and that's the one that I really did not care about. I feel like for fans of you know Taylor Jenkins read I would recommend this. It's more of a drama and that setting might appeal to people more than the ones who are looking for really wild intense like thrillers. I think my main disappointment with this is that there is a mystery and there is thrilling moments but they're more off page and they're just referenced. We're not in them. We're never feeling the tension and suspense but it was still a three because I really think that Rachel Hawkins writing is addicting and I love a toxic friendship being explored so it was a mix for me. And we've got Winter Accounts by David Hesco Wombly Wyden and this is a story of a guy named Virgil. He's a part of the Lakota Nation like the author and he takes it upon himself within his community and the reservation to enact revenge or um, be a kind of vigilante, the things that the police or the tribal council won't focus on. He goes and he gives people their comeuppance and he's hired by people um, to hurt other people in various ways. At the beginning of the book, things hit really close to home for him because his nephew has gotten into some drugs with a bad group and he wants to shut down drugs in the community. And so he spends a lot of the book with a partner of his um, driving around, going to different places and tracking down the source of the drugs and finding out a bunch of things going on in the underbelly of the community. The relationships you're following with Virgil and various people and then also his own relationship with his spirituality are the strongest part of this. The actual mystery itself just doesn't get doesn't get more interesting as the book goes. You're just slowly trying to like wait for him to figure everything out and it was just okay. I don't think the writing did anything particularly special and revenge plots themselves rarely work for me so who knows why I picked this up to begin with um but yeah it was a three. It was okay. Now we'll get into some sci-fi. So this is horror sci-fi but definitely leans more science fiction, much more science fiction in my mind. If someone were to ask me, have I found a five star horror yet this year? I would still say no, because this and Chlorine, though they were five stars, they fit solidly in other genres before horror, though equally uncomfortable for sure. So this story is confusing for the majority of it. And it's it has a good payoff. Obviously, I gave it five stars. Um, it's one of those things that if you DNF'd it, I would recommend picking it back up unless you DNF'd it for like the grotesque imagery and not wanting to read that. But if you just found it a little bit confusing and you were lost, it does explain itself and it gets more enjoyable as you read. But we're following this nameless genderless doctor and they arrive at this manor and there has been a nameless genderless doctor who has died before them. And what you find out is that they have this shared consciousness with all of the doctors who live 
here. Um, and so it's a really interesting thing that I've never quite read before, where it's not just shared like thoughts and perspective, but it's like shared education. And so when they get to the manor and they find out how the other doctor died, they discover a parasite. And they can look in their like mental catalog and know everything any other doctor has ever encountered. So they know right away that they have never seen this parasite before. And now they're tasked with protecting the manor, but also, or the chalet, but also finding out like where the parasite came from and they're doing tests on it. And they're just like checking it out and seeing what happens. And while that's going on, there are a lot of relationships building here. So there's like a baron and his family, and they're talking about how they provide like food for the community and how even if the parasite got involved in that, how they can't shut that down because capitalism. Um, you get to know different people who work at the chalet. And what's interesting is this doctor has memories of all of these people because they've interacted so many times before, but nobody knows that the doctor has this shared consciousness or memories of all of these people. So it's just fun because they can always pick up on when somebody is lying or they know they've built this rapport with somebody so they know what to say this time and the things that they like and the things that they care about. It's all about those who have power here. It's all about those who've been damaged by that power. It's all of the learnings that the doctor has about science and self and humanity. And I thought it was really fantastic. Everybody who's been telling me to read this, thank you so much. I was hoping and assuming it was going to be in the horror category of Goodreads last year and I didn't get around to it because it was in the science fiction one and I've just been itching to get to it. I'm so glad that I loved it. Then we have Skyward by Brandon Sanderson which I gave a four. This is something that I look at similar to The Hunger Games where I think if I read this as a teen and I was really into like this kind of plot because I probably wouldn't have been as a teen but I'm sure I would have enjoyed it more if I was more in the age range of Spencer. So if you somehow don't know what this is about, um, she is kind of among the last of the human race and she wants to become a pilot. And a lot of people in these clans uh, want to be pilots or are forced to be pilots or whatever um, because there's like creatures trying to infiltrate their planet and there's a lot of war and they are tasked with protecting things. And her father used to be a pilot and he died in duty because uh, he like abandoned ship and he was a traitor and he was a coward and that has followed her for years. And so when she wants to become a pilot, everybody who's in charge of allowing her to become a pilot tells her that she can't because she cannot be trusted because of what her father did. She, of course, loves him, doesn't believe that's what happened. So while she's training, forces herself into the academy um, and is getting to know everybody who's a part of Skyward Flight and training with her. And they're fighting wars already. They're getting into it really quick. People are dying left and right. The stakes are high. She's also taking time outside of that to look into what really happened with her father and if everything is true. Um, she isn't allowed to like stay where everybody else is allowed. She has to like live in this kind of underground um, cavern and she discovers something along the way and finds like a passion that is still within piloting, um, but it's something that she can focus on and do outside of all of the pressure that's going on within the program. It was fun, it was interesting. I definitely wanted to know more about the world and how we got here, but it's a long spanning series, so I'm sure that does exist. And that's that. Now getting into some fantasy stuff. I finally read Grey Warren by Maggie Stiefvater. This is the final book in the Dreamer trilogy and the final final book of the Raven Cycle Dreamer uh, grouping of books. We're done with it all. There is like graphic novels to come which is interesting but this storyline is finally over and we got all of the answers of what is all happening in the series. So the Raven Cycle you learn about um, ley lines and magic and psychics and there's this king that they're trying to find who's been buried and maybe he can kind of grant wishes. That sounds really silly. It is silly but it's fun. And there is something about this character named Ronin who has dreams and can maybe pull things out of dreams, bring things into dreams. And in this series we find out more about that and the things that are created and how they exist in the world. And you're also following not just Ronin from the original series, but all of the people that he kind of interacts with in his like new adult years. And then he also has relationships going on with people from the Raven Cycle. Um, as far as a final book 
in a trilogy. I thought that it wasted some time introducing new characters and new concepts that I didn't really want to learn about. I just wanted it to be more warm and feel more final and I didn't really get that. And then the focus isn't just on Ronan naturally. In every book in the series you get less of Ronan, you get more of all of the other people in the series because clearly like Maggie Stiefvater just loves the characters she has created and gives them a bulk of the story. I don't think that many of the reveals in here were particularly interesting. I gave it a three because I still like existing with all of these people and it felt familiar. And Maggie Stiefvater's writing within this series, like nothing else I've ever read from her, but this is just so well done and there's certain use of like repetition that is really powerful but overall it was just okay. I never knew who to recommend this to because I feel like I have a different perspective than a lot of people. A lot of people who loved The Raven Cycle still love this series and then people who hate The Raven Cycle, so people who've continued on seem to love this series. So I don't know if I've just like kind of outgrown it or I'm just looking for more character development and less plot because this series is so much more plot. Anyway next I've got the God of Endings by Jacqueline Holland. And this is like fantasy, supernatural, um, but very lightly. I would say it's a mix of The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue and Woman Eating and Matilda, but not in the way that there's like a magic child, but just about the way that there is a teacher who is so caring and loving and soft. She gives huge Miss Honey energy and she herself is like the creature in the story. So you're going back in time learning about this main character's childhood and how she grew up and how she became a vampire or just like became immortal but does have to feast on blood to survive and you're in that timeline and seeing all of the things uh, that she has to do to survive and getting used to this immortality. And then you're also in a future timeline where she is a teacher and she's really solid in her life and just living more peacefully. And then suddenly there's a child in her classroom and she starts to question if he's safe at home, if there's some abuse going on. And she inserts herself as like a protective figure and learns a lot along the way. She does see this child as like a prodigy. He's really artistic as is she. And so that's how they build this connection and she wants to support him throughout his endeavors. Um, but it's really, it's really slow. It's sad, it's melancholy, but I just found it so interesting. I ended up giving it a four. It was almost a five. Like it felt like it could have been a five if it just got a little more, I don't know if I wanted like action. Maybe I wanted some more existential moments, some more reveals, I don't know, but it was really good and super memorable. Then the, I think one general fiction, or like adult general fiction that I read this month was Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reed. Uh, this is about a black woman in her 20s who is babysitting for this white family. Pretty late at night, she takes the child to a nearby grocery store and a scene erupts where people are accusing her of kidnapping this child. After that, everyone just reacts completely poorly to the situation. There's a lot of people in like protective mode, protecting themselves, trying to protect Amira herself, um, trying to prove that they're not racist, trying to protect her from other people who people are trying to convince her, that they are taking advantage of her. She just comes into contact with a bunch of people, the family themselves. Um, she gets into a relationship. She has this group of friends. There's a lot of dynamics at play. And then you also just get to follow her on this journey of like figuring out what she wants out of life. She is kind of apathetic for a good portion of the book and her life. Um, she doesn't have a lot of passion, but she is committed to caring for this child. And so she continues to do so throughout the book, even though mess starts to come into play. And it's just horrendous to witness everything, all the ways that people speak to her, all the interactions that she has, as well as we get a good chunk of the book um, about the mother specifically, whose name I forgot, Alix, how could I? Um, and the life that she's created for herself and um, how kind of fake everything is. I ended up giving it a four. I thought it was really solid and I'm glad I finally got to it because it's been on my TBR for years. Next up we've got the one anthology I read this month. It's called Tell Me Pleasant Things About Immortality by Lindsay Wong. This was a four star or just under a four, 3.75, maybe 3.5. There was two things in here that I think because they stood out so much 
and we're such definitive five stars that I want to give it a higher rating but there's only two of them I think it was the title story there was one that was about this woman and it was really grotesque and nasty this is a kind of a mix of Cursed Bunny by Bora Chung and Out There by Kate Folk but in the middle of those two as far as like how gross they get and then the other one I remember was called Sorry Sister Eunice which was like a collective um, group of girls and kind of targeting one of them. There was also the ugliest girls that was really good and there was in one of these like a reality show uh, about um, people consuming stuff in the name of immortality and all of the stories were about immortality. Some of them were just like these slice of life stories about how their dad became a couch and that's how he lived out the rest of his life um or like never li never ended his life because he's now a couch instead of a human and how they just sat on him and chatted with their dad and then one of them was just featuring this 300 year old woman and like the skin peeling off her face and how grotesque she was to look at i would definitely read more from lindsey wong if we got a more variety of like science fiction speculative stories that weren't all on the same theme because i think what she was saying about immortality uh really came through and then it was hammered home a little too much because there was like 15 different stories that a lot of them had the same message the one non-fiction i read this month i ended the month with this because i felt like it would be a five star because the last Vivek shreya i read Read, um, I'm afraid of men was a five star. This was exactly what I was expecting and it was perfect and I gave it a five. It's called People Change um, and it's just about the changes that we go through in life and the importance of change but the pressure of change. So she talked about um, being women or femme or femme presenting people and the pressure to constantly be reinventing yourself especially if you are in the arts if you're a celebrity if people have their eyes on you constantly while men don't really have that same pressure we talked about how women have been judged throughout history for like wearing makeup and wearing a false face and how witchcraft was blamed and it was about being deceitful um, and trying to be seductive with your makeup but then it also talked about like how empowering change is how awesome it is that you can change things about your appearance with makeup and not just physical changes but internal changes and how making new friends can be really daunting but there's something about being friends with somebody who doesn't know you and you have the opportunity to be someone new and do stuff that you've never done before because your old friends know a certain version of you and would expect certain things from you. So it's just a series of really simple but effective essays and especially the last one that talks about um, gender I think was really vulnerable so um, I'll read you a little bit of it. Five years after coming out as trans I worry that I conflated transition and reinvention. Despite my efforts to complicate my own beliefs about femininity and womanhood and to explicitly express this complexity in my presentation and art public transness has merely transplanted me from one box to another. Admittedly because I wanted to be believed I sometimes perpetuated the idea Idea that I was now at long last my true self. The promise of possibility that I believed was latent in a transgender identity was stripped by the popular understanding and pressure around transition. Now I feel stuck having to forever embody and assert a standardized trans womanhood. This is a dangerous admission because of the widely held assumption that trans people are confused, uncertain, and change our minds. But I'm not confused. I am certain that I want to keep changing. And I just loved that whole section, obviously, as well as everything else in here, because I gave it five stars and I would definitely recommend this. Then lastly, I have my chunk of books that you might think I should review individually and at length, but most of them were just because I wanted to read like childhood favorites of people, some classics that I got into so much in the video that I'm just gonna run through these. So A Mango Shaped Space by Wendy Mass is a story of a girl with synesthesia and coming to terms with that, learning about it, the community that she gains, and then also the family and homework um, that she abandons because she finally feels seen and understood by other people. I've heard of a mix of ratings from people who have synesthesia that, that um, over dramatized it but then some people said they felt perfectly represented. I think it's a good introduction to synesthesia but if anyone has any other um, ones that I could especially recommend to Liam that they feel is a better representation obviously that's what I would want him to read but I read that because he recommended it to me. Then we have The Princess Diaries by Meg Cabot which is about this girl um, who in high school gets told that she is now going to be the princess of Genovia and she has to take all of these princess classes with her grandmother 
and then she can be royalty. <laughs> I'm not rating those. Then we had the boxcar children, which I never read growing up, but it's about these four orphans and they find this boxcar to live in and survive in. And it's about their struggle, um, finding food and finding work and figuring everything out. And then their grandfather saving the day. And apparently the series is like a bunch of mysteries that they solve. Then we have the Bailey school kids, number one, vampires don't wear polka dots, which is about these kids in school and they get this new teacher who looks and acts like a vampire and they try to prove that she is a vampire. Then the little prince is about this guy who encounters this little prince who tells him all about uh, the universe and all of the series of events that he has been through where he goes and visits these different planets and talks to these different people and all the things that he has learned um, about patience and love and joy and whatnot and I thought it was perfect. Then The Outsiders by Essie Hinton is about this group of boys um, who are judged for the part of town that they come from and they create this unbreakable bond and it's everything that they do after one of them kills somebody in like the rich part of town and the friendship and the bond that happens and also um, the sadness that exists within their group. It was also kind of perfect. Then I have The Princess Bride, which I didn't give a rating in the video. And then a couple people said that um, because I'd listened to the abridged audiobook, it ruined my experience. But I gave this a four. <laughs> I really did enjoy this. And there were sections that I went back to and I read the proper intro and everything to understand the story fully after I watched the movie. And so this is about a princess bride, but it's really about this guy who's telling the story of the princess bride. And he shares a story with somebody and the story has been told to him. And so he is abridging the story within the book and just telling like the most exciting parts of this Princess Bride tale where we have Buttercup and she is becoming royalty, but her heart belongs to another. And throughout the story, she is getting kidnapped and given and taken from various people, moved around a lot for everybody's own personal gain. And, you know, love prevails. It was funny. It was charming. And I definitely see what the hype's about. So those are the 19 things that I read in August that you're allowed to know about. There were a couple other things going on, um, but most of these were featured in videos already. So if I somehow have lost my voice, um, <laughs> if you feel like I didn't get through everything here, maybe I've expanded on my thoughts better in those vlogs. So I'll link the couple that I did this month down below and I will see you in a couple days with a whole new one.